So um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, this is an incredible opportunity to host this panel and to be connected with all of you in this digital future. My name is Benaz Farahi. I'm a designer and critical maker based in uh, Los Angeles. I was born and raised in Tehran, in Iran, and I moved to US. Um, uh, and I just finished my PhD in media arts and practices at USC a School of Cinematic Arts. This is a very exciting panel, and we are going to discuss transculturalism and the space in between, especially how we might operate in between different cultures. And this issue becomes so prevalent with globalization as different cultures come in contact with one another. But at the same time, in the light of COVID-19, uh, we see that this utopian fantasy of global inter interconnectedness start to fail. But also for me, this in this and I'm sure for the rest of the panel, uh, this in this political climate, which the existence of uh, sexism and racism could be felt so brutally from the death of 14 years old Iranian girl murdered by her father in Iran as an act of honored killing to George Floyd's tragic death in US. I think we might wonder that what are some of the key constructive notions that we need to revisit in the world of art, design and architecture. So I'm extremely excited for this panel to discuss the role of um, uh, the role and challenges and limitations of art and design, and how could we maintain this sense of uh, transculturalism. I'm also very uh, I'm I'm very honored um, to be with this uh, very special guest. I have to say that both Christophe and Emilia have been a long inspiration for me. And in fact, um, my admiration of Christophe's work goes back to when I was back in Iran uh, before 2011. So yes, art community in Iran knows of Christophe's works and also Eastern European cinema of Andrei Tarkovsky, who, by the way, wrote the, the foreword in um, uh, Christophe's book. Um, uh, so, um, before I officially intro introduce Emilia and Christophe, uh, let me just give you an overview of the format of this panel discussion. First, um, Emilia is going to provide a brief um, theoretical background to the topic, then Christophe will present his work. Um, uh, it's a, it will be a little uh, casual presentation. Uh, after him, uh, if it's not too intimidating in front of such two distinguished guests, I will present my latest work, which I have been working during this uh, lockdown, and then we'll open up the discussion. So let me officially introduce our guest. Um, Amelia Jones is professor and vice dean of academics and research at Ruskia School of Art and Design at USC and is curator and a scholar of contemporary art, performance, and feminist sexuality studies. Recent publications include Seeing Differently, A History and Theory of Identification and Visual Cultures in 2002, co-edited the issue with Erin Silver, otherwise Imagining Queer Feminist Art History in 2016, an edited issue on trans performance, which by the way, the idea behind it was so inspiring for me and um, have motivated uh, much of discussions for today's panel discussion. Emilia is currently working on retrospective of um, Ron A on the work of Ron 80 with um, accompanying catalog, which will be opening in, in, in New York and Los Angeles 2020-2021 and a book entitled In Between Subject, A Critical Genealogy of Queer Performance is forthcoming. So keep an eye out for it. Um, our next guest is Christoph. Uh, Christoph Wodivsko is professor in residence of art, design and public domain at Graduate School of Design at Harvard University. He is renowned for his larger scale slide and video projections on architectural facades and monuments he has realized more than 90 of such public projections and installation all over the world. Since the late 1980s, his projections have involved the active participations of marginalized and estranged city residents. Simultaneously, and also internationally, he has been designing and implementing a series of nomadic instruments and vehicles with homeless immigrants and war veteran operators for their survival and communication. 
It's my true honor, honor to welcome you both, and I could have not imagined better um, two panelists to with whom we, we discuss this issue. So thank you so much. And with that, Amelia, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Banaz. It's, it's my honor as well, being with the two of you. Um, so I'm gonna approach this first through the problem of finding cultural strategies today, which I think it's kind of uh, really haunting anyone working in the art and cultural sphere. Um, the situation of extreme volatility that we're in with the rise of nationalism, the pandemic, the collapse of capitalist economies, the divisiveness of nationalist leaders, all of these things call for conceptual terms we can mobilize on the streets, but also on digital platforms. And I think what I'm gonna talk about is kind of how artists have mobilized sometimes both of those things at the same time. So, you know, the, the terms that are hovering around this in the way I've been thinking about it all involve the concept of the trans with a, with a hyphen, which means it is a prefix, it's not, a self-contained word. So I like the fact that it mobilizes a whole range of terms. And I'll talk about that a, a little bit more in a moment, but more or less that it calls forth the idea of moving across and through, um, and also can provide a sense of collectivity, but always in motion. So there's a sense of mobility to the word. So first I want to address what could be mobilized through the idea of trans with the problem of the binary. Um, so if we're thinking about the problems of colonization and certain forms of globalism promoted by the moneyed interests in the West, we're probably gonna be still thinking about that in terms of the problem of binary or oppositional thinking built into Western thought possibly. Um, that's certainly the kind of structure that we think about challenging the notorious self versus other of the Hegelian master slave, um, which has come to be embedded in concepts of identity, but also has come to be mobilized through identity politics. So it's both acknowledged, but also um, used as a tool, starting, of course, with people like Franz Fanon and Simone de Beauvoir. So the binary also seems to be inherent to digital code, of course, because it is based on zeros and ones, but there are paradoxes in both of those sets of binaries. Oppositional power structures might mitigate yet also dictate the supposedly free flows of capital and culture in the global. So I think we're living right now the really dark side of the free flow of information and capital. Um, and of course, the COVID virus shows us that that flow is working quite well. Um, and in fact, it's literalized through this virus that we can catch by traveling and by coming into contact with other people. Um, so globalism in its official terms, the way it's mobilized, especially by Euro-American power structures is often very binary in it's uh, usually kind of covert support of the people with money, of the corporations, et cetera, um, which is veiled with a kind of gloss of neoliberal happy globalism. So with the trans again, there's the working across or through. So it starts to do something else. And what I'm interested in is the artists and thinkers, um, and there are legions of them really, especially since the rise of what we used to call postmodernism or postmodern theory, um, who are thinking not in opposition to oppositional thought, because of course that would be an unhelpful paradox, but are thinking across and through those ways of thinking. So often this involves modes of intervening rather than attempting to overturn. Um, and of course, there's a whole raft of thought coming out of your American philosophy and cultural thinking. And I would posit as a whole other paper that 
the ways that we've been able to loosen those binary structures often do have to do with our contact with other cultures, with indigenous cultures and so on. Um, so let's not pat ourselves on the back as Europeans for inventing post-structuralism as if it could have happened without an awareness, for example, of Buddhism or indigenous sexualities, et cetera. Um, that's a whole other paper. But here I would just say that, you know, there are lots of words that have been mobilized over the last 30, 40, 50 years, such as performativity, Derrida's concept of difference, black feminisms in the US with their concept of intersectionality, which starts to think of identity more in terms of networks and relationality rather than in oppositional terms. Um, queer as a concept of fluid non-difference at its best. Someone like Jose Munoz coming up with complex terms such as disidentification. And of course, trans theory and trans identification in a gender sexuality sense, which can be very mobilizing. So um, there are theorists who mobilize and open up thought, usually, again, I'm, I'm positing by intervening or infiltrating. Um, and one of my favorite thinkers who does that with this problem of the digital being binary is Laura Marx, who has this really bold and possibly it's a little too extreme for a lot of new media theorists, but I just love that she goes out on a limb with this basically materialist theory of the digital where she embodies electrons and argues that in a sense, digital images are also indexical. They're also traces of these kind of materialized forms, which um, Manuel de Landa calls inorganic life. So like that's the kind of concept I'm interested in. It, it makes us like suddenly kind of shocks us away from these banalities about the digital being disconnected to materiality and makes us think about it completely differently. And as I was rereading her essay, I thought, oh my God, inorganic life is like the coronavirus because for reasons I don't fully understand, it's, it's not considered a living thing, a virus. It lacks something that humans call um, crucial for life, but how can it not be living if it's literally you know, inhabiting us? Um, so with that in mind, I then started, uh, I was very excited to be thinking about Christoph's work again. And of course I started thinking about Christoph in, in some senses, I think of you as the paradigmatic infiltrator. Um, and you, there's a literal aspect here of, and I'm gonna share my screen here, um, rather than pulling over a monument, you're literally re-inhabiting it, making it be something else. Um, and so this very new project, uh, Monument for the Living, which is this um, site-specific commission in Madison Square with a Civil War statue on which is projected these beautiful uh, video testimonials by uh, people who have been refugees. Um, so I don't think I'm gonna play it. I'll just describe it that way and people can look it up or maybe you'll show it later. Um, then I thought also of the Electronic Disturbance Theater, a group arguably, there's a lot of debate over this, but arguably led by Ricardo Dominguez from UC San Diego. Um, and I, I first heard Ricardo maybe 15 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago, speak about this idea of um, that he was developing with electronic disturbance theater, the idea of a DDoS or distributed denial of service attack using flood net. So he and his colleagues would find ways of flooding, for example, the website of the US Department of Defense um, so that it would suddenly read something totally different. So again, it's infiltration. And in this sense, it's a form of very specific of creative activism that is 
involving not just the digital, but actually websites, you know, that belong to the state. And needless to say, he's gotten into trouble with the FBI many times. Um, and that's part of how the work is so effective is that you know you're having an effect if the FBI is on your ass. Um, and then actually very recently, I thought about, of course, Black Lives Matter. And I had the privilege of actually um, teaching Patrice Cullors, who is one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter. And I'm just gonna show a really brief clip of one of her daily digests. Hey everybody, this is Patrice Colors with the Daily Digest, and it's so good to see you. I'm so grateful to be here today. International updates. Facebook, folks are going after Facebook right now, full on. I'm just going to stop there. Um, what I wanted to say about Black Lives Matter is Patrice came to us to get an MFA as an artist. So she does actual performance artwork at places like the Broad Museum, um, and she does obviously global scale activist techniques that cover everything from street protest to these Instagram updates. And she's now become a major media presence in the mainstream old fashioned media, such as Newsweek, Rolling Stone and Time. Um, also, I briefly flash by, you know, there's Black Lives Matter LA has its own Instagram account. Black Lives Matter LA has its own website. And they're very, very smart about choosing very kind of strategic themes like defund the police. It's not just like a vague idea of, you know, Black Lives Matter, let's support Black people. It's very, very strategic. And Patrice has also formed with some other USC Roski graduates, Alex Doritz and uh, Noe Olivas, this Care Not Cages project um, where they have raised a lot of money and then had a contest which prisoners who are artists could submit work in order to win these awards. The first award, Paul Colors, I'm guessing is related to Patrice. Um, second award, third award, this is a very beautiful uh, queer trans uh, black dance piece. So, you know, my point is really that they are infiltrating on all these different levels. And I think people don't realize that about a movement like Black Lives Matter, they tend to just see the mainstream media portrayal and take it at face value. Um, but we can, we can all, we all have access to um, becoming friends on Instagram or Facebook as toxic as those corporations are um, and becoming a part of these infiltrating gestures. So the end point here is that they are not just opposing they are working to form, and obviously this has always been part of identity politics when it's really working well, they work together to form positive coalitions that are generous, open-minded, and that reform what we think Black lives mean and who has a role in improving and protecting Black lives. So it's, it's, I think it's really much more complicated if we start looking carefully at how smart these younger generation people are using not only social media, but uh, you know, real IRL, street protest, and so on. So in coming to an ending, you know, I would just expand on this idea of the trans with a hyphen. Um, which I address in that special issue of performance research from October 2016. And what I was interested in was kind of mobilizing um, a set of concepts that relate to performance because of that specific uh, venue. But really, I think today I was imagining how malleable this idea is and how much it applies to Christoph's work and to Black Lives Matter because it's such a capacious but, but pointed term. So the trans keeps language and being in motion. The trans 
implies across or through. Again, I would insist that it be used as a prefix. Um, I use the term trans rather than trans as a prefix for reasons explained by some theorists of actually transgender who argued that the trans as a prefix keeps the term suspended in an implicit relationality. And relationality, I think, is a really important part of how these infiltrations work. And I would say, Christoph, you're engaging these communities and hearing them speak and putting their voices in the public realm. So there's a relationality between you and the refugees, but also, of course, because it's in public space, they work by creating a relationality with an audience and essentially changing public space and changing the meaning of those monuments. Um, trans in Mel Chin's terms is not a linear space of mediation between two monolithic autonomous poles. Rather, it is conceived of as more emergent than determinant, intervening with other categories in a richly elaborated space. The prefixial trans opens up a broader sense of movement across, through, and beyond traditional classifications. Um, so, in closing, you know, we clearly need to get away from you know modernist avant-gardeist ideas of overthrowing the government. That that didn't happen with the Russian constructivists. It's not going to happen now. Um, but there are all sorts of artists and creative thinkers who are giving us ways of imagining, and in fact, they're doing it, right? That they're infiltrating, they're working across social space, they're transing, they're working transculturally, um, transtemporally, transhistorically, and they're creating spaces of dialogue that are relational, but also, again, they're reshaping social space and also cognitive and mental space. They're changing what it means to be American right now. So I'll stop with that. Well, wow, that was fascinating. I mean, uh, thank you so much, uh, Emily. I think um, the idea of trancing uh, or relationality is definitely something fascinating, but also in terminology of how many words we have, translation, transmigration, um, uh, transculturalism, transdisciplinary, and all really, all this tension between different, different spaces that occupies in between. I think it's really fascinating that, um, thank you for raising that up. And uh, but we will come back to more conversation. So, Christoph, uh, if you're ready, we can. Um, uh, I can just present uh, my screen, and I'll show the uh, work, and Christoph will talk over it. Does it sound good, Christoph? Okay. So uh, in this uh, project, you see the, Oops. Um, a new mutation of drone. Uh, uh, November 2000. Well, I can hear voices that disrupt me. Okay, you know, I just can hear them as well. Anyway, so <clears throat> what you see here. Uh, new mutation of drones, the drones that actually have uh, eyes and have uh, megaphones, uh, megaphones that actually are in place of human uh, lip or mouth. So they are actually speaking, flying, and you have to look up to them. They are, you cannot... Uh, uh, look down at them. So it's very important that uh, they appear in public space so visible. Well, Hannah Arendt mentioned on a few occasions that uh, uh, inequality is connected with invisibility. Therefore, visibility and equality uh, go hand in hand. 
of course, we're talking about people who are perceived as uh, partially uh, real and partially uh, unreal, partially natural and partially artificial. They are strangers, they are displaced people, mostly by civil wars. They end up, for example, in Italy. They're coming from Ethiopia, from Romania, from Senegal, from Morocco, or Libya. Uh, and they are landing in Italy uh, as their new uh, place. Of course, they are treated at best, tolerated, as always strangers do. Uh, so that the issue is how people like this could actually have a voice in public space. They should have, in fact, the first opportunity to open up and speak if we want our democratic process to move forward because they see the world from the point of view of, of, of biggest problems. They are witnesses to atrocities, to injustice, in which, of course, the country to which they arrive are implicated somehow. They are philosophers, they are lawyers, you know, they have uh, things to say. They have serious doubts about the places from which they, they arrive and also big doubts about the places to which they arrive. They are uh, between the mother tongue and, and, and new language, between the lost land and, and, and promised land. Uh, they actually uh, are prophets in some ways because they denounce and announce the world. They hope that their voice, if it heard, if it can be heard, will create conditions under which there will be no place uh, that it is right now. It's a strange kind of utopia, a utopia that could be called no place. No, I refuse this place. And refusing this place, I hope that there will be no place for such place in the future for myself and for my children for all of you because of what i witnessed uh, before i arrived here and all i witnessed upon my arrival here so just look up at me and listen uh, for change oh, you've been uh, uh, always using drones to surveil and observe us but you forgot or you didn't notice that actually we are observing you. We are observing you because it's a matter of life and death for us. We have to watch everything you do. The way you, uh, of course, we don't say much because it's too dangerous. So that's, the, uh, that's how those drones were operating in Milan. Uh, in uh, other projects, I create other conditions in which we have to really come closer and bring ourselves closer to uh, the presence of strangers, but also recognize that we have no foggiest idea about those people. That was a Venice project in which actually you could, you could also see that you don't see them. You see how foggy image you might have about them, yet you'll hear them here in Tijuana. Uh, that's uh, that's a, a very important project because you actually see uh, those people speaking in public space, uh, people of whom that space knows nothing. They are maquiladora workers. They are they are of course uh, almost inclusively uh, young women who actually are uh, you know, trapped in those uh, in this labor assembly lines along the border. So here they are speaking about uh, their life, about conditions of their life, uh, speaking through El Centro Cultural, you know, the place that's supposed to be for uh, cultural projects. Oh no, that's a cultural projects, of course, uh, not very much in tune what's really in that center is presented. This is actually an IMAX theater. 
in which at the time of a projection, there was uh, another projection going on inside called uh, People of the Sun, uh, trying to force us to believe that there's a glorious history of relationship between people of Mexico and people of United States. Uh, you know, here actually uh, that relationship is very much here uh, presented through experience of those women. Uh, one of them, for example, uh, became black. His, his per white person became black, poisoned by solvent. Uh, you know, working the, uh, in in assembly line and cleaning some parts to be sent back to original market. You know, uh, that's uh, that's the story. The story about domestic abuse, about violence, but also cartels and, uh, and all of those uh, uh, real estate uh, uh, tycoons and all, all of those superpowers that actually are uh, making the fortune on the misery of his people. Uh, so that's, that's this kind of projection is, uh, is something that uh, requires enormous amount of commitment on the part of those people in order to say things that they say. That process itself is very important part of the project because they start to say something and they talk because they are, that's, that's connected with their trauma. They cannot find words. So then they start recording it again. They start speaking one more time. Now they, they find more words. So the process of regaining the voice, of finding words and metaphors for unspeakable experiences is part, hidden part of the project. Without working one year with those people, there would be no projection. You know? And of course, they see themselves speaking and being heard by lots of people. Uh, they reintegrate what they say. So that for them is incredible experience. That's what they told me. Of course, bef that process of speaking is something to do with participation, involvement of friends, families, you know, the, the crew producing it and investigative journalists and, and all kinds of people, maybe, maybe 500 people are behind the scene involved. That's what I called inner public of the project. Those people are highly informed about the project, even if they are not participating in it actively like, like those women. But they appear on the side of projection as intermediate public, you know, be, between the, the, the public, external public, <laughs> and those first public actually are those people themselves, because they decide what ought to be made public that is actually relegated to the private experience. They make things public. And then they involve other people. And then of course the whole process is successful in the sense if they can make use of the project for their lives and for lives of others who cannot participate in this. If they can do it, that's their success. If they cannot do it, it's my fiasco, it's my failure. I take full responsibility of that story. And unfortunately I am that actually they were so working so well, trying to make sense of those projects that they, they surprised me in fact, and they add new meaning to it. And not, on very few occasions actually, there was some negative uh, disappointment, but the risk is there in this kind of work. So this project, uh, uh, is uh, is in, uh, developed in Belgium in the city of Mechelen in a very beautiful uh, city hall, uh, Renaissance city hall, um, uh, uh, with people who were illegal immigrants in Belgium. So their faces are completely uh, invisible as much as with uh, project with drones, uh, they didn't want to be recognized. Uh, their voice even sometimes was altered with the use of some software. So they could not be immediately uh, uh, identified. Well, but the, the, one of those people actually speaking uh, about his life, he's coming from Russia probably, or maybe 
uh, Russian Ukraine or Ukrainian Russia, uh, is he, he witnessed murder of somebody. So he he's cannot sleep. And he always says, I always like look at people's eyes because then I can detect more who they might be. But I cannot sleep because I'm afraid anytime somebody will kill me. Why? Because I witnessed murder. As one of the, the Polish poets said, the romantic poets said, the murderers are trial by witnesses are murdered. So he is one of those people. And of course, there are people from all kinds of countries without documents. Um, in fact, this place, uh, this plaza here, next to the, the very beautiful facade of City Hall, there was actually a, a Flemish block, you know, the right wing party <laughs> headquarters. That, uh, trying to do nothing else but to uh, uh, to actually deport immigrants. Of course, uh, Belgium also well, is going through its own kind of uh, uh, soul searching because of uh, what they were doing in Africa. So uh, there is uh, there's lots of things going on right now, and that's begun that time. So that, some of those people actually are from Africa who are speaking through this. City Hall. So uh, that, that's uh, in some ways all those projects are also masks. Uh, even in Tijuana projection, we have full face. Face is distorted. So it's it's that we don't know whether it's actually the building or the face. It's a face or facade, surface. It's a surface. So if they say it's not me, it's Vodichko's work who did this thing, or actually it is me. It's so it's not clear, but in the other projects, you cannot really recognize because they requested that they will not be identified. And that is a good situation for them that can tell the truth about their experience. So mask, the virtue of the mask is that it hides in order to reveal, you know, to disclose the truth. And truth telling is very important part of this because that was called parousia in ancient Greece. It's a fundamental right of a very small group of polities at that time, people who had rights. But now it's supposed to be because the First Amendment is actually supposed to be accessible to all of us. So how to really create conditions for people to be parousiastes today, you have to create lots of media projects. It's not possible to really stand up in Agora, or even if it was Agora, uh, like it was in the past. No, you have to be, uh, you have to, a voice has to be mediated. Has to, but in order to give the people microphone, they still cannot say anything. I mentioned this before. You know, you have to create a long process in which they open up in the open and they use public space to actually. Uh, say things, maybe sometimes for the first time in their lives. So that is, those projects then are not just simply political artistic projects, they're also psychotherapeutic projects. So he is a therapy and, uh, and uh, political social engagement is also connected and truth telling, parousia is also a term used by psychotherapists. So, it's it's all it's all one large project, psychological, political, oh, of course, aesthetic media project. Uh, so that's what I do uh, in order to be uh, useful uh, as an artist, uh, as some kind of agent. But I cannot really be agent if I don't find co-agents. So those co-agents are people who speak on their behalf, but also on behalf of others who cannot speak at this time. Therefore, they see their own situation as part of a larger picture, you know, and they really do it in order to make change for the future. So that's how I try as an artist and designer. It's so amazing it's so amazing to to see the, the 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 your work and how you speak about it and it's so important i i can't even articulate 
but thank you so much, Crystal, for sharing these words. Um, I hope I was doing enough DJing here. It was okay from, from my end. Uh, if it's okay, I'm going to share my latest work, which might be relevant to uh, some of the concepts that you just raised, including mask and eyes. And I think, um, um, so I'm just going to quickly um, share some of that and then we open up to discussion. Um, it's not going to be tough to speak after uh, you, Christoph, but um, I'll try. So in the past few years, I've been working on uh, including bringing technology to the world of design to address um, uh, the, the relationships between the human body and uh, the space around, ranging from the scale of variables and fashion all the way to architectural space. But I was mainly interested to address critical issues such as emotions or human perception, or in fact, social interactions. But the work that I want to share now, which is more relevant to the context of this uh, um, panel, is my latest work, uh, which is inspired by um, historical um, masks um, worn by women in southern part of Iran. And legend has, has it that these masks were developed um, to protect women from Portuguese colonial rule looking for pretty women. Uh, from obviously from contemporary perspective, um, you can say that um, uh, these women, uh, these masks are protecting women from patriarchal colonial oppression. At the same time, I was reading article by the feminist uh, theorist uh, Gayatri Spivak with a very interesting question that can the subaltern speak? Um, and, and whether it's possible really for the colonized um, uh, to, to have a voice in, in the face of colonial oppression. Uh, and then uh, this really made me think about that how we can think about bringing this question in the context of uh, contemporary digital culture. And if you look at these masks, you can see that their face is fully covered and their eyes are the only place that you can see. So the eyes become this a strong medium, uh, this emotive, uh, expressive medium that has the presence for communication, for expression, and for many, thing, uh, many things. So I've been thinking about how eyes are important as a medium for expression. And I came across um, this was, oops, oh, sorry. Uh, this was uh, an American soldier uh, who used his eyes um, uh, to basically required. express the word torture. Yeah. Um, no, I don't know what uh, is happening. But, uh, Basically, he used um, his eye blink is, to, uh, to say the word for torture for using Morse code during his captivity in Vietnam. Is, um, so uh, uh, obviously this film that, was um, uh, for propaganda purposes and, and uh, it was broadcast all, all around the world. Um, Obviously, the use of the code for transmitting information is nothing new in the history, uh, from Navajo language that used uh, during the World War II to Alan Turing using uh, computation for breaking Nazi Enigma code. Um, and, but also more recently, some um, uh, incidents, for instance, uh, during this lockdown of COVID-19, we see that women, for instance, use uh, code to report domestic violence, both in France, Spain, uh, all over the place, really. Uh, or in other examples, for instance, we see in Facebook uh, AI lab, two robots developing their own language that is not comprehensible to human. And that's become apparently so unnerving that the scientists had to intervene to make sure that the algorithm is understandable to human. What are this telling is knowledge is the power. And if you don't understand, or if you're and you have inability to understand, that would unnerve uh, those who wish to maintain the authority or, or the power. So um, with that, inspired by all these concepts, I've been interested in the notion of mask. Um, and um, I've been wondering that how we can develop a mask that they can, this mask, they can develop their own language um, and the language can evolve in the communication between the body of the, 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 the bearers. 
Um, and as the, the blinking, um, the eyelashes in rapid successions using AI generated Morse code, they can communicate with one another. With that, I wanna show a video um, and the music I have to say is a collaboration with a, with a, with a very, very amazing Iranian musician, uh, Susan Dehim. Um, it's just, uh, uh, I want to speak over it, so. love to say just a few more words about a uh, notion of translation and language because you also have uh, both touched up uh, on this um, notion. I mean it's obviously it's clear that the history has been written by those who have the privilege to have access uh, to the colonized language. Um, and um, in that, what I mean is that if you want to have even opposing view, um, you first have to be comprehensible. In order to be comprehensible, you have to first um, um, already conform to established meanings. And here I am puzzled because the moments that you want to understand meaning through language, um, the words in, in itself can be translatable from one culture to another. But then the meaning of the words can be so different. Um, uh, the word bread probably, um, it has so many different meanings in Iranian versus Polish versus English. And Crystal, for instance, in your work, you give voice to marginalized uh, group um, in their own language, which is really interesting because you're in a way giving them this voice. And in my last work, I attempt to see if it's possible to produce or develop a new type of language. So the, the issue of language is really fascinating and I would love to hear from both of you that how you would see the, the challenges or the difficulties of language when you're translating from one culture to another. And um, I have a specifically a question for you, Christophe, that do you think their message, the, 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 the voice of this marginalized group have been understood, have been heard? Well, the language actually, um, the language sometimes is the very topic of what they say. For example, the Italian Senegalese or Senegalese Italian who was part in this, of this drone project. He actually spoke about this. People ask me why I say I am Senegalese. They say, you speak Italian so well. Uh, I say, sure, I speak Italian well, because I have been here for 13 years. I was born here. It is li like a mother tongue for me. But then when I go to Senegal, I lose a bit of the vocabulary and also the accent. Personally, I feel like a chameleon because I have never asked myself the question. I act on the basis of who I have in front of me, family, friends. For me, the essential thing is to communicate with people. So this is what he's, he was trying to say from the sky. Uh, so this kind of new identity, identity that is in between, in between this is, is something in which those people operate. Uh, so yeah, that they sometimes speak about this or they also speak some part of in their own language, older language, and then they speak a new language. 
So each time the story is different, right? So that's why they, they um, I just allow those people to expose the issue of language as part of a law. I encourage them. Yeah. So uh, where they are understood, uh, that's another matter. Whether they are really understood, do we really do? Can we really understand those people? That's, that's another issue. <laughs> I mean, I think so understanding the the fact that we will never understand them it's very important part, you know. And maybe I see, I feel that that part I can feel people pick up, you know. That after all, they say, "Wait a second, I will never really understand I will, that situation. I never thought." Going to coming to Italy via Libya, just that part is impossible to understand because they go through torture camps to, to special uh, places where they're being kept, you know, for ransom for their families. The same with people coming from, uh, from Honduras, uh, for example, or uh, to, through Mexico to the United States. So between cartels and coyotes, you know, the, you know, it, and so I start talking about it. I think it's impossible. I, you know, but that is very good way of understanding the impossibility of understanding. Exactly, and and I think um, Amelia, you mentioned the notion of other and the self, and and do we ever understand the other? I mean, if. Um, uh, also here, I want to refer to uh, Slavoj Zizak, who say that it's just absurd that we actually say that if we understand the other, we just have to come to the terms that we keep the other in enough safe distance and um, uh, we just tolerate. But my fear is that if we never understand the other um, and if we just keep it in enough distance, is that uh, become sort of um, ego ideal of that that conceals the experience of uh, racism uh, that we say that as a nation or as an institution that we say that oh we are already committed to diversity we just bring the people in but we just keep them in enough distance but we don't actually integrate with them and this would lead eventually to some sort of uh, racism so I would really love to hear how you you would respond to that I mean I think the most interesting way to respond for me is to stop thinking about it as, well, there's this white monolithic American culture untouched by otherness. And so then we do this thing because we're in power and we erase those other cultures. Actually, what we call white dominant culture is what it is because we've lived with other people all along we exterminated Native Americans. I have an ancestor I found out who moved to what is now Rhode Island in the 17th century and you know bought land from Native Americans. And like, but whether or not you have that in your history, we have learned from Native Americans. We have learned from African Americans. So there is no outside you know, we're all constantly informing each other. So the lie is when, you know, white, white supremacy is the lie. It's the thing that says, oh no, there's this, you know, hallowed dominant culture, which we're not gonna say is white because that's the secret and everything else we have to put out there because it doesn't belong. But the thing is, it's always belonged. So that's where the violence is, is, is the, the act of separating something that's actually in some ways is obviously separate because they're oppressed and killed by police. But you know, in terms of identification and identity, it's never been separate. This land has never belonged to white people, so you know, except by force. So I guess I would just look at it differently. I think that we have to really start looking at it differently. And I think that's why I like these mobilizing concepts or practices. Like if you start looking at Black Lives Matter, and for me, it's through the lens now of Patrice Cullors as an artist, just because I had her in my classroom. But 
you know, just looking at that as a wide scale, multi level practice that's reminding white supremacy that they have they belong here just as much as anyone else, and that you know whatever to remind us of the history. Um, in terms of language, you know, the impossibility of understanding. We have to. I think we have to believe both that we can try to understand, but also that there's an impossibility of understanding. I mean, and psychoanalytically speaking, we can't even understand ourselves because we have an unconscious. So I don't know about you, but when I wake up in the morning, every day I'm baffled by this thing that seems to be me. Um, yeah, and and there are artists who deal with that like abstractly. And then their artists, like I was thinking of Guillermo Gomez Pena, who's one of the most brilliant infiltrators of language. Yes. <laughs> he literally fucks with English and Spanish. Right. And it's this crazy, and then that's the language. Like that he's, obviously there are other people who do that. I lived in Quebec and there's this whole franglais thing where people under the age of 50 speak rapid, like this language where they're combining French and English. And that's the beauty when you, when you realize there never was a self and another. It was, language is always changing. Language is always learning from everything around it. So in Tijuana, uh, because lots of people came from San Diego, <laughs> for this small, town San Diego <laughs> to this huge metropolitan <laughs> Tijuana, <laughs> uh, they, uh, they need a translation. So there was simultaneous translation during actual real time uh, projection. And I realized something happened, something was very strange happening. And, and so I, picked, so I got the head, headphones and I realized that the translator burst into tears. Oh, wow. I'm actually a professional translator. Mm. It's a completely against the rules. Any, any rules of yeah, simultaneous no translation. But that, so that maybe was the really translation. That was the real translation. That yeah. did not really translate. So the emotional was, thing. Yeah, there are those moments uh, where language there is a communication beyond the language, official language. So the people yeah. scream, people sing some of my projects, you know, or they, uh, the, the, the emotional charge is, is much more important than what they say. Yeah. So also the emotional charge of the listeners is important. So in Tijuana, you could see couples listening to this uh, domestic abuse and uh, rape and incest, incest stories and they're embracing each other you could see how stiff this embrace was you know it got to their bones because of course they identify with the buildings and with monuments we mm -hmm. all are the monuments the monuments are our projection identification we project our mind so we have a life with those now when the monuments start speaking the truth, it goes to our bones, to our body. And now, so I just realized that uh, what people understand, uh, they understand something in them understand sometimes, you know? <laughs> and so I try to shake, get to the bones because the monument the statues and humans, for example, there is a special relationship between them. They are particular generals or uh, lofty, uh, you know, civic leaders, but also they are humans, somewhere between life and death, as we all are. So kids, okay, so we project ourselves on them as humans, not only as generals. So of course, when the generals start uh, speaking, uh, you know, of things of which, you know, we don't fully understand what it is, we really try to, to in co cohabit those monuments, you know? <laughs> because mm -hmm. we inhabit them in part, somebody else inhabiting them. So there's a cohabitation going on. Is this understanding? I mean, uh, there is certain act of listening and act of speech uh, that converge here. 
And, and I think people will remember this. Maybe later, another time, under in different circumstances, uh, you know, they might actually understand something or something else. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I was gonna say that um, you really transform. Like um, this uh, uh, panel discussion is part of a larger digital futures, which is an initiative for architects mainly, but um, uh, computational design in general. But you really, uh, Christoph, you transform architecture, which is something aesthetic typically, and monuments, which is usually aesthetic to something which is dynamic and brings life uh, with projecting so many story and narratives of people to the landscape of the city. But what is interesting for me is that you already bringing, for instance, the, 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 the voices of abused women to Tijuana uh, border or illegal immigrants to uh, the facade of the building in Belgium. It's like you're bringing the sort of very specific cultural issues, which is very local to a global yeah. landscape. So I wanna hear, how do you think about like global versus local? And do you think at any point this contradiction would be um, disappeared? Well, and I, my work is so specific. Well, when I uh, developed a project in Seoul, in Korea, some uh, artists uh, or critics in Seoul told me nobody in Korea will ever make such Korean work, <laughs> no, because I, I'm, I'm an outsider, so I do my research, you know, and also people confess, they tell me things, they, stranger is a perfect uh, confessional, so People tell me, and because they know I will leave, so I will not be part of any discourse. I will not be part of any camp. So, so that's why I am becoming. I really reached out Kore the Korean topic, for example, from so many angles, and I really try to engage people, all kinds of people, into the project that they themselves cannot do who live there. So, in in that sense, uh, it is very specific. But then, uh, when I work from one place to another, uh, the problems are actually similar. You know, they're very specific, but also they are similar. There's, there's always, a, 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 all, all the, each city speaks not only what it says, but also what it doesn't say. So the, the silences of, of those places have to be uh, discovered, has to be revealed, you know, has to make a loudly or clearly articulate way. Um, uh, reinserted into public space. So that way it's not, yeah, there are different proportions of problems, but they seem to be very similar and that's very un unfortunate. You know, you're talking about the issue of identity, relation to strangers, you have know, certification, uh, all of the, the real, the, all the things related to uneven development of the cities, as we used to say in the 80s, you know, all of the urban and cultural geography issues, they seem to be similar. So in that sense, being every time like chameleon, you know, uh, adopting uh, or adopting <laughs> to a particular situation, I feel very much crossing borders with more or less the same uh, hope to give a voice to people. And they're not that different. Was the most clear similarity uh, so, uh, when it is in the case of working with uh, war veterans, no matter where I go, the same story comes out. The same type of trauma, the same kind of alienation, the same kind of injustice, the same kind of thing. So, uh, but I pretend each time the situation must be completely different. I start from scratch as if I knew nothing. <laughs> so that's how I work. I might be maybe exaggerating this global aspect of it, but I think it's contradiction is in every place I go, it's all contradiction. Brecht is useful everywhere, you know, in revealing those contradictions, <laughs> in, in actually creating alienation effect, you know. So in that sense, uh, 
I guess Brecht would know what to do in uh, in Los Angeles as much as in Berlin, right? In that sense. Yeah, what do you think, Amelia? Like, do, do we ever get aware a sort of uh, also um, issue of uh, identity or can we say that we are become more fluid and we can just be sort of uh, citizen of the world? Can we ever get there? <laughs> just oh, no, no, no. Citoyen du monde, I don't like. Yeah. <laughs> this is not what I endorse here. No, no that's, uh, that's different. I think it depends who you are and what the moment is. I mean, just to look again using Black Lives Matter, like this is a moment to be both specific and international about a particular identification that is both created through violence and oppression, but also becomes a voice of agency, you know, to create a coalition to stop that violence. Um, so it's become global. I mean, you saw that snippet of Patrice saying, okay, here's the global update. Um, um, the and every day, every day she has, yeah. yeah, she has like, she has connections in France and in Belgium, they threw the, the, the statue king. of Leopold into yes. you know, the ocean. And however, it's also radically different, like being black in this specific country is very particular. So it is both global and very local. And it's local to the point where even Black Lives Los Angeles has very particular structures and ways of thinking mm -hmm. and political goals. Um, so the defund the police and the prison reform prison initiative, you know, there's a very specific history of brutality in the police here which is different from the brutality of the police in Minneapolis, which is different from the brutality of the police in the American South, where they came directly out of slave patrols and the KKK. That KKK thing is still here in Los Angeles because the real estate and railroad magnets actually recruited white people to come here. And so guess what, you know, that white supremacist, <laughs> Um, goal of bringing white people here, then you're you're bringing all of those structures of oppression. So it's both local and global. You know, there obviously a coalition has a has a moment where it has to say for this particular issue in this moment we're all the same, and then that always already immediately breaks down because in fact it's never true. The women's movement is a perfect example where, oh, whoops, it turned out it was white women, you know, speaking well, for everybody. Thank you so much for yeah. saying the way you presented it and explained, uh, you know, I really like, you know, you, you basically did say things that I would never really be able to articulate so well. But that's how I also see in specificity and, and global. That's how I see myself as a specific agent who helps co-agents uh, mm. to take over and be, but at the same time, you know, I need to move from one place to another. I cannot stop because when I stay too long in one place, I lose the capacity to be helpful, you know, in that sense. Of course, I am staying in New York more than ever, but I travel. I try. I try. Well, you've always been a nomad. <laughs> but I'm not Citoyen du Monde. I am not. No. No. I, I don't have this kind of lofty detachment, you know, of uh, enlightenment person, you know, who is no. the balloon seeing the world being round like Payne, Mr. Payne. No. Of course, I like very much Mr. Payne at you know, the time you know, he was saying those things, but. No, that would they will not really see details, you know, from this balloon. So it's it's also like urban uh, cultural geography is all a little guilty of seeing the world too much from balloon, from the high up perspective. I'm just uh, looking to see if there is any questions that we get from live forum. If 
anyone has any questions, please post. Um, um, Can I just say on one more thing about that, that Christoph, you know, you research these specific buildings and sites in terms of the history of the city. And yeah. I think that's part of what I'm talking about in terms of the trans, you know, is you're, you're almost like translating a building into something else. You're making it speak in another way. Um, and actually just very recently in terms of tearing down monuments, which is often a great idea, although I also like the idea of translating them into something else. But there's been a discourse in Los Angeles about, well, if we're gonna tear down racist monuments, we should be tearing down the freeways. Because in fact, the freeways were built and they destroyed, of course, neighborhoods of people of color. It was never the rich white people whose neighborhoods got ruined by the freeways. So. I'm all, I mean, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> I ride my bicycle and take public transport. So I figure that's the only way we're ever going to get people in LA out of their cars is just tear them down. I love it. <laughs> and, you know, what, like, and that becomes not only like an environmental issue, but also a politically progressive way of reconnecting neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. hmm. Uh, well, that's a sep we should have a separate session about monuments uh, in the uh, context of what's happening right now. Yeah, it's uh, the, because the issue, of course, is not what to do with monuments so much, but what to do with memory. So, what I'm uh, I'm uh, definitely uh, focusing here how to memo memorize the whole process that led to those monuments uh, removal or destruction. And perhaps that should be ongoing process in yeah. which people participate and contribute with new voices, new actions, new protests, maybe on the very site of the monument that was removed. You know, that yeah, I love the cases. Yeah. I love the cases where they graffitied the, you know, Robert E. Lee, so you can't even see the statue anymore. So it's another version of what you're doing in a way is they're reappropriating yeah. it for. Yeah, so yeah, they, anyway, that's for another uh, another conference, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It's good it's really to, to generate topics for next yeah. meetings yeah. like this. Yeah, that would be that would be absolutely amazing. Another conference. Um, I think uh, we're ending to our, toward the end of our session. I want to really thank you both. This was an incredible opportunity to discuss these topics with you. So I really appreciate that. Um, um, do you have any uh, 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 final words that you would like to share? Um, <laughs> well, I think my comment about tearing down the freeways is <laughs> Um, which is a mode of transing by prohibiting certain kinds of transit and turning them into something else. So well, that's our plan. <laughs> that's my plan. Yeah. Oh, I, my, I don't have any final words. I just want to stress that importance to work um, not uh, only for people or on behalf of people, but to work with people. So this seemed to be a, a specific methodology that, uh, of course, you can see it's present even in some uh, uh, parts of academia in terms of, uh, you know, pedagogy and uh, various ways of advancing public art uh, with people. But it's not really perhaps developed enough. You know, I, I just feel that it's hard for me sometimes to talk about this year and a half work with Makila Dora, uh, with Factor X in Tijuana, to really, uh, the, I, I, it's always this issue of uh, art criticism and art discussion about art that is uh, focusing on so-called uh, result, you know, rather than the process. Yeah. So uh, people always ask him, ask him, what was the reaction of the audience? But they don't ask me oh, in what way people who are speaking through those projects made sense of it for their life. You know, 
And, 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 and how, how, what was the process? How many people were involved? What, what was happening? So this is bringing the participatory art, the term that I don't like, the participatory, but we don't have a better word for it. And well, of course, uh, uh, you know, there are books written about this. And it's very good, but it's still a long ways to go to really uh, have more discussion about working with mm. collaboration. Yes. And I think that's exactly why I think the issue of translation was also very important in your work, because I think uh, the moments that uh, the, 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 the people that they come, they express themselves, even in their own language. It's as you mentioned in your talk, it's like the moments that you have to articulate to bring it to word, even even in your own language, it must be so uh, traumatizing because a lot of emotions we have is just abstract and non-linguistic. And the yes. moments you translate it uh, to, to a word. Well, that, that's this... why um, I like the projects that you presented because uh, I wish I made some of them myself. And there is something we, we, yeah, yes, we share our appreciation and uh, fascination with mask, but you really push it in a way that really fascinates me. Because, yeah, the speaking through the mask, you know, the eyes, of course, they came from African art, you know, you have all those multiplicity of eyes. It comes in various uh, places, I know, Ethiopia and some other place where people are actually speaking to the eyes were also to protecting them against the attack so there was little like uh, like face of medusa you know or aegis e you know this is deflecting the attack at the same time expressing something mm -hmm. so that's what uh, you know, the shield you know the roman soldiers have and so forth I really like this slide, this slide, a line of thinking is of course close, very close to my heart and my walk. But what I congratulate you, and please don't take it. it it's, no, I really like what, what you've done. It's not, I'm not going to patronize you. <laughs> say, yeah, you're doing well. No, I wish I'd done this myself. So. Uh, perhaps we should exchange wow. notes for future. May I learning something from this? So thank you. Wow, that that comes from you, Christoph. It means a lot for me because you've been the main inspiration before I come uh, out of Iran. So I appreciate that. Well, thank you for for this kind of feedback. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> So we get a lot of love and and uh, thank and and uh, good energy in the forum. I just wanted to pass that. I want to also thank the Digital Futures team that has done such an amazing job to put this event together. They're working. I know that they're working nonstop, um, and they're 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 really uh, leveraging um, to build a digital future. So um, thank to their team and all the people who are involved in that. Um, with that, I wanna thank you again, Emilia and Crystal for your time. It was wonderful to share this panel with you. Well, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you for you, having Emily. me. It's fantastic. I learned a lot from this. Thank you, Amelia, for all those references to the theory. I will definitely uh, start to Thank try to find you. those things and read more. Fantastic. Thank you. Have a Thank great you. evening. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye.